Yeah, I need you on the daily, daily Couple weeks and I'd go crazy, crazy Yeah, I need you on the regular, the regular Yeah, I need you, yeah, I'm telling ya, I'm telling ya Yeah, I need you on the daily Welcome to Depots with Debbie. So we're usually sitting in that chair. Today we're sitting here. We need to get like a little bit better lighting or something. But um, yeah, today is going to be a little bit different instead of what I've been doing. Um, first off, I want to just share a memory with you guys. I was just thinking about like the hunger I had for God as a child and really admiring it, you know, as I really believe kids can and youth can capture this fear of the Lord, this hunger for this, the Lord, the hunger for things that are of God. And as a kid, I was always so excited to like go to the, the Lifeway Christian bookstore near my house with my parents and you know, spend my money on a new devotional and I'd sit there and I'd read a ton of them on the floor until I decided exactly which one I wanted to take home with me. And, um, yeah, I, I thank God for the kind of parents I had and the environment I grew up in that really allowed, like, encouraged me to seek the Lord in such, um, with such a hunger and of course I've gone through phases of like hungering after the Lord and thirsting after God's Word and then not like comes and it goes even you know in a week and especially over years and today we're gonna like look at a child but this child has a heart that is for God, a heart that's enamored with God. And we can learn from that and return to that. Like Jesus emphasizes that it's unless you enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God with the heart of a child, like you're not going to inherit it. But those who humble themselves like children are those who inherit it. And we can return to that heart for the Lord, return to that hunger for God, that childlike wonder about scriptures. Um, we need to. And I feel like today did that for me because we're looking at very, very familiar passages, but also with just new eyes and exciting eyes and familiar eyes too. Sometimes it's cool to read a story that you've heard over and over and over and it just hits you again maybe the exact same points maybe something new but it just hits you again and there's an ex a thankfulness for that familiarity and a wonder with that familiarity a gratitude for this story being a part of our history as believers so today we're going to look at the anointing of David David and Goliath and a couple other things but these are really like key notes big stories and so I didn't actually get to all the passages in scripture I was hoping to today but let's jump in so we're in first Samuel 16 to 18 and then we'll look at Psalm 86 and we'll look at the other passages tomorrow so the context is um basically Samuel is just leaving from condemning Saul for his sinful acts and his disobedience and clarifying like okay Saul you're no longer king and the word God doesn't want you as king that's it and so this is the context and we open chapter 16 with Samuel just weeping he's like have I get the I get the image you know like in rom-coms when the girl just broke up with her boyfriend and she's eating ice cream and sitting on the couch and they're to go boxes everywhere and she's just sitting there doing nothing and her best friend comes in and is like, come on. It's like the same thing with Saul, with Samuel and with God right now. Like Samuel's sitting there and crying and crying and crying and God says, 
How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. And he gives him instructions where he's to go. So Samuel's just been sitting around upset about this king not working out. And he has no clue that God has a better king in mind. And probably Samuel feels invested a little personally because he anointed this king. He had dreams for this king. But he had to let go of that. And so God sends Samuel to Jesse who was a Bethlehemite, and Samuel's like, okay, I'm going to go, and, like, I got a cover story, you know, like, what if, like, Saul's surely going to kill me if he finds out I'm anointing another king, so I'm going to say, like, oh, I'm going to go make a sacrifice and invite Jesse to do it with me, with his family, so he's got a cover story, and he shows up, and obviously he starts with the eldest child, whose name is Eliab. And Eliab stands in front of Samuel. And sure enough, Samuel's like, okay, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And God says, like, mm -mm. Uh, and this is a, such a powerful verse. Verse 7, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So, one by one, Jesse's children come before them, and he's like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. And I can just imagine each time Samuel is getting a little bit more and more disheartened. And they go through all their sons, and there's no one left. And he's like, okay, Samuel says, are all your sons here? And Jesse said, Okay, there's, there is one more, but he's the youngest, the scrawniest, the smallest, and he's out keeping the sheep. So he wasn't even, like, worth bringing to the lineup, essentially. And Samuel says, like, go get him. And sure enough, this is when we first meet David, and this is the description we get of him. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good description. We hear he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome and God says like mm, this is the guy like arise and anoint him for this is him and Samuel takes the horn of oil and anoints him in front of all his brothers and the spirit of the Lord fills David not just that day this says and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward and Samuel gets up and goes so we have this anointing, which really doesn't make sense in the earthly standards. Um, and then we also have a conflict. When God's spirit, when like Samuel anoints David as king, and God's spirit fills David, it's almost like he takes his spirit away from Saul. And Saul, it says, Verse 14, right after he, David's anointed. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit of the Lord tormented him, probably as punishment for his disobedience, the way that he has led the Israelites into sin and disobedience and really just living for himself. And this harmful spirit torments Saul so much so that he's, like, asking his servants, like, I need someone to calm me down with an instrument, with a lyre, so get someone. And one of the young men, one of the servants says, like, okay, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, he's a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. So clearly David has a good reputation as a musician, and... He sort of gets this glowing recommendation, which I don't know is super accurate because he hasn't really been a man of, man of war. He has been a man of valor, as we learn later in his tending the flocks. You know, he's had to be strong. But he gets this glowing recommendation, and Saul sends, like, for David. And so David comes and starts, like, Saul starts loving his playing, and... 
not only does he come often to play for Saul to calm, calm him down, but Saul appoints him as his armor bearer. And I'm not entirely sure if that has great significance or if it's just kind of like one of those honoring titles that you give someone to say like, I like you, so I'm going to make you my armor bearer, you know, like. So anyways, uh, that's that's a title he gives David. And yes, Saul's refreshed by his playing. Um, and then we jump right into what's going on political, politically. We have the political scene is set. So we have this kind of hill, mountain, valley, and a mountain. And on one side are the Philistines, and on the other side are the Israelites. And it seems like they kind of just hit a standstill. And the Philistines think they got this victory in the back. They have this guy named Goliath, who's this huge, tall guy. And, you know, he's still a man. He's not like some mythical giant like we see in a lot of cartoons, like, so incredibly huge, but he's he's really tall, and so we have this really tall guy, and he's decked out in great armor, and this is what he says. He says, like, okay, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard this, the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So they're set up here, and here's the trench. There they are. They send Goliath down here, and it seems like every day this is what he starts his day off. Like, doing. Goliath goes down. He's like, send me a man, Israelites. Like, if I beat you, like, you become our servants. And if you kill me, like, we become your servants. So that's the sort of proposed deal. And Saul, the leader, is totally terrified, and all his people are terrified, and they're just sort of camping out there. And a little context, the three oldest sons of Jesse have been sent into battle. So this is Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah. And they've all been rejected, you know, by Samuel to be king, and they've seen their younger brother being anointed as king, and they probably think it's ridiculous. But the three eldest sons have been sent off, and they're there. And David is tending the sheep, and then he's bringing food back and forth to feed his family. Um, on Like his three brothers on the field, he brings food from home. So basically, he's kind of like a water boy of the army. <laughs> you know, he plays no significant role. He's just there to give his brothers some nourishment. And... One food trip, David's there, and he is giving his food to his brothers, and he basically gets a little curious. And while he's there, he hears for the first time from Goliath's mouth what is happening. He hears this, um, and he sees the reaction of Israel. Everybody's freaking out, scared, shaking in their boots, and... This is David's response. Remi reminder, he's a young kid. He's not huge. And he's never really been in a battle, per se. And he says, and takes away the approach from Israel. Like, basically saying, like, like, what's the reward for the guy who ends up doing, like, ends up winning? And then he says this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. You know, emphasizing this guy is not even qualified to challenge us, let alone our God, who is alive, who's well, who's powerful, and who has claim over this battle. And everybody's like, um what? <laughs> you little kid, you don't know what you're talking about. And his oldest brother is like, what are you doing? Like, you just came down here so you could check out the battle. Like, you're not, you're supposed to be with the sheep. Like, whatever. He's obviously feeling a little entitled here, Eliab. He's like, I'm, 
I'm the eldest son, you know nothing about battle, like go home, you little curious George, you know, like choo choo choo. And um, basically David's words brings him into the presence of Saul the king. And Saul's like, okay, what's your plan? And David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul's like, um, you are not qualified. You're not able to do this. Um, and David fights back with his resume, with his qualifications. What makes him worthy to be right where he is? And he says, when a lion or a bear came after the flock, I took it. I took it on, you know. And this is so cool. He says this. <clears throat> well, your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, this is verse 37, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Ah, oh, such great faith in such a small boy and in, in such an intense circumstance. So with this, Saul's kind of like, okay, this guy, if this guy wants to do it, okay, let's just like get him ready. Let's not look stupid. Let's not give the Philistines any more reason to make fun of us. So let's get him in some really good armor. And he gets him in like a really good armor. And David's like, mm, I haven't tested this. I don't want it. Take it off me. So they take off the armor. And this is what David chooses. He chooses five smooth stones and puts them in his shepherd's pouch. And it, he had his sling. And that's it. And he goes out. And he's sort of behind his shield bearer as they're walking out. And finally, when they see who the Israelites have decided to challenge Goliath with, they just rip into him. They're like, what? Like, you sent a boy? Like, this is ridiculous. There's some funny, serious smack talk going on here. And this is the smack talk that David returns with. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And then he basically says, like, I'm going to win. I'm going to cut your head off. And then says, so that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. So this perspective that David has, which is, so much bigger than his fellow Israelites who are trembling is amazing. It's not that he's fearless. I was thinking about this. David is not fearless. He fears the living God. He has a fear of God, not a fear of man. And it's in with that fear of God that he is fearless in the sight of man. He's like, mm. Like, you pitted yourself against God, you're going to lose. So, I'm just going to come at you with the name of God, not in any fancy get-up, so that you know that it's not because I was highly skilled or anything. It's just because I came at you in the name of the living God. Pretty awesome. They go at it. David runs quickly toward the battle line, and he grabs a stone, slings it, it strikes the Philistine Goliath in, on his forehead, and it sinks deep, probably hit just a pressure point, and he falls on his face to the ground. And David runs up and grabs a dagger and cuts off his head. And, oh, I didn't even notice this. David uses the Philistine sword to cut off his head because David doesn't have any kind of dagger on him. He just takes the sword of Goliath, his very own weapon, and cuts off his head. And 
that is a phenomenal victory. That's an epic story. Like, talk about underdog winning, but not really an underdog. If you have a fear of God, you realize, okay, the Philistines didn't have a chance. If there was somebody in the assembly of Israel that had a proper fear of God, they stood no chance. And awesome. Saul is like, whoa, this guy's the real deal. Who is he? Like, who's his father? And everybody's talking like, I don't know. His servants are like, I have no clue. Let's just bring the boy in and ask him. Like, mm, we don't know. And he says, like, I am the son of your servant, Jesse. And so even though David's actually been in the presence of Saul before and Saul really liked him playing music, he really never thought of him as anything of value on the battlefield and really didn't even bother to know what kind of family, what family he came from. <laughs> even his name, I guess. But, yeah, as soon as, like, David finishes speaking with Saul, it's clear maybe his son, Saul's son, Jonathan, was in the, in the area. And there's this sweet beginning of 1 Samuel 18 that talks about this relationship that Jonathan and David have. It, it says, The soul of Jonathan was knit to the, son, to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as, as his own soul. And Saul takes David in, and away from his family and now David lives with the royal family so probably Jonathan and David are spending more time together and we have this unique moment verse 3 it says then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his belt and his bow and David goes out and basically is having a tremendous victory for Israel over and over in every battle. Like the God, the living, the living God is with him. So he's having victory after victory. But this unique moment where Jonathan gives up his robe and his armor is kind of like this moment where Jonathan recognizes a king with a fear of the Lord. Almost saying like, Jonathan's thinking, okay, I'm kind of in the line of the throne right now, but I'm looking at my father, and I don't see him as a king. I don't see him leading the people the way that a king should lead the people. And with that, he basically says, I'm removing this lineage from me, this inheritance that's due me, and saying, you are worthy of being a king which is such a fascinating move. Um, and, and a distinction between Jonathan and his, and his father is, Jonathan's not jealous of David's victories. He, he sees David and celebrates what God is doing with him. Whereas Saul, just like he was jealous with his own son, Jonathan's victories, is now increasingly more and more jealous of David, so much so that he begins to pit himself against David. He recognizes that David has the, the spirit of the Lord. And when, this comes in a lot of different ways. But one way is just because the women on the street are saying, like, okay, Saul has a ten th or his thousands that he struck down, but David... He has his 10,000. And with that, he has several different plans to wipe David out. And the first plan is, he's like, send David to like play his lyre for me. Because I feel my, my spirit is unrested. So just like before, David comes in to play his lyre. And Saul like throws his spear at David, hoping to pin David against the wall. And David evades him, like, twice. And that plan did not work out so great. So, yeah. And, meanwhile, David's just winning all these battles and getting 
favor with the Israelites. They love him. They're like, oh, yeah, like he's doing this. He's, he's the real deal. They really like David. And here comes the second plan of Saul. He's like, okay, I'm going to promise my eldest daughter to David so that he can marry her um, so that the people think I like him too. You know, so that it looks good on my side. And while he's waiting for his bride, I'm going to send him into battle. And basically hoping that the Philistines are going to kill David. And the Philistines don't. And Saul doesn't like his plan anymore, so he gives his eldest daughter to another person. And his, one of his other daughters, Saul's other daughters, Michal, Michal, Michal? Um, it says that she loves David. Again, probably with David living in the household of the king, they've seen each other, and she knows his reputation. And Saul thinks again. He's like, oh, I'm going to use her as bait. So he gives the word to, to David. He's like, I'll give you my, hand, my daughter's hand in marriage, Michal. And David's like, um, I'm a poor man, and I don't have any reputation, so I can't really pay a big, like, bride price. And Saul had already thought this through, and he was like, okay, send me, like, come back with 100 foreskins of the Philistine, and I'll give you my daughter. And again, he's thinking, oh, Samuel's going to die, or... David's going to die at the hands of the Philistines. And lo and behold, David does it successfully. <laughs> it's just a gross thing to think about. And they count it up and they make sure. And sure enough, he has enough. And Saul has to obey. So he gives Michal um, his, his daughter as a wife for David. And increasingly, Saul is hating and hating and hating David and it says even like afraid of him and is his enemy continually but furthermore I think again Saul is just insanely jealous David has the victory David has the respect of the Israelites David has the spirit of the Lord with him. It says in verse 28 of 18, When Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. Not only does David have the presence of the Lord, but he has a loving wife by his side, and that freaked Saul out. He's like, oh. So, that's the end of story time with Debbie. Super long. You can realize why I didn't jump ahead into, like, the betrayal of Jesus, which is what we're going to read tomorrow. I was going to read all that today, and that was going to be a lot of storytelling. Tomorrow's still going to be packed. But, I wrote down some takeaways. So, one, um, from the story. One, David is chosen by God, not for external qualifications, but because of his heart. And two, David's humble beginnings for his training ground, his conditioning, like God was conditioning his heart, soul, mind, and strength for what God had for him. For example, when he was battling lions and bears to save his flock, God's even conditioning him for what it's like to be a king over a flock. David's learning what it means to put yourself in harm's danger for the sake of your sheep. And God wants him to do the same thing, the same lessons. He's like Miyagiing David <laughs> right now, um, if you watch Karate Kid. And so, number three, David didn't orchestrate his kingship. He kept living his life, worshiping God, and put and God put him where God wanted him to be. 
So, though David's anointed as king in front of his brothers, he's still doing his daily job. He's still in the fields with the sheep. He's still bringing food to his brothers on the battlefield. He's not walking around entitled like, I am now king. I deserve this position. He's just treasured that knowledge and is patient knowing God's going to do what God's going to do. And God puts him in Saul's presence playing, you know, playing the liar. God puts him in front of Goliath. God puts him in these moments of favor in battles. Um, four, God, David had such a high view of God, such that he wasn't afraid of anything that set itself up against God. Again, we talked about that. Not that David is fearless, it's that he fears God. Uh, five, David knew the weapons and protection he needed. Um, He needed just stones and God and a sling. And it's not that he was stupid or foolish. He was still strategic. He still had to fight. He still had to sling his stone. But he, again, wasn't fearless, but rather feared God. And he came in with a strategy Ultimately, he trusted God to be the victor. And he gave him the glory at every moment, before and after. Six. Saul sucks as a leader because he only really thinks about himself. I'm just thinking about how much time and energy Saul is thinking about himself. Am I safe? Am I respected? Do I have fame? Do I have love? And furthermore... What, and and his schemes to kill, like, David over and over and over. And I'm thinking, like, okay, while he's doing all this, how is, how are the people of Israel being led? And David's off fighting battles, and Saul's just in his throne thinking about how to kill David. So he's a horrible leader because he's thinking about himself. And we see later that... It's, it's kind of a temptation of those put in power. David does the same thing that Saul does. He's overcome with jealousy in one instant. But um, he repents. David repents. And Saul doesn't. He's just stuck in this selfish ideology. Uh, number seven. God gives David two important gifts. In addition to his Holy Spirit, in addition to empowering David, He gives him a friend who loves him, Jonathan, and a wife who loves him. And though David is going to cycle through other women, which is just kind of frustrating to read in scripture, but it's also kind of what it was like at the time. um, This is what we see as a good leader. Like, because a king and and a leader cannot be isolated. Like, two are better than one. And it's what made Saul fear David even more when he saw that David had a wife that loved him and this presence of God. And unbeknownst to Saul, a good friend, Jonathan. And I think this is a really good model for leadership for us as well. Like, wow, this is a long video. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Like, our leaders, it's good for them to have good like, same-sex friendships. Like, to have... It's good for a guy to have a good guy friend, you know? Not in a sexual relationship, but in a friendship, because we need that. And then it's also good for for David and for men to have wives who love them, who respect them, who support them. And... Again, echoing this, two are better than one. Like, Jesus sent his disciples out, like, two by two. You know, we do better when we're not alone. We live pure. We live um, more accountable. We live, like, life is more fun with friends, right? So, anyways, that note, number eight, God didn't remove David's hardship, but he did protect David in the midst of it. So again, God didn't say like, oh, you don't have to fight Goliath. 
I'll do it for you. Like, oh, don't go into that room. Saul's about to peg, try to peg you against the wall with a spear. You know, oh, don't go into the house of Saul. Like, he's about to hunt you down and try to kill you over and over and over. And we're going to later see that. This really is a huge part, a huge chunk of the Psalms is David just saying, like, my enemy's pursuing me, Lord. Like, get my enemy off my back. Like, please, Lord. It's a really hard circumstance. But we see those moments to what he knows about God. And he rests in that. He ends in that. He pleads for help. He pleads for deliverance. And yet he still just depends on God, knowing God is good still. And that brings me to my last point is, David is typically called, you know, this king, a man after God's own heart. And I love that. And we see even maybe that's because God saw his heart, and his heart is the reason why God had chose him. It wasn't because David looked good or was strong, but God looks at his heart, and that's how he chooses David as a leader. But we also see David's heart in Psalm 86, which was, just randomly what was assigned in my reading today and happens to be a psalm of David, which is interesting because we haven't seen a psalm from David in a while. Um, but we see David's heart, which it just continually elevates God above other gods. He says, like, there's no one like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any words like yours. All the nations have you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. He just lifts God up, exalts him, even as he's crying out for help. He just exalts God, affirms who we are. Verse 5, he says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. And he ends in this, he just ends in a prayer, knowing, elevating God so high, he knows that he needs the Lord in determining how to walk, how to live his life. He says, verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Oof, I love that. So just some takeaways from today. Tomorrow we'll look at Jesus and the New Testament readings that I had planned to read today. Have a great day. Bye.